Okay, so you guys, you guys should know us by now, um, and stuff we do. Um, and you'll notice that we do, we do a, a wide range of products, both for um, professional researchers down to university professors teaching classes, undergraduates, graduate students, and K through 12. Um, but m mostly fifth grade and higher for things um, with stuff. And we have a for our education outreach products, uh, we sort of have two areas that we have things in: formal education, classrooms, and informal education, everything else. Um, and some of those things overlap. So you'll hear me talk about uh, something for schools, but you might have a use for it at your museum. And some some things for the museums actually work in schools too. So let's take a look and see what kind of things we have. Um, if you didn't know, um, here's something that wasn't mentioned so far. Um, Popular Science had a, a little contest um, about uh, a year and a half ago um, where they wanted to find the most epic science project that was currently in existence. And they had all kinds of criteria for how much it cost, how many people it affected, it, um, how big of an area that it covered, uh, coolness factor <laughs> with it. Um, I don't know what their basis for coolness factor was, but the staff of Popular Science voted on things. And in their list, there was stuff like the Hubble Space Telescope, um, the, the gravity wave experiment in Louisiana looking for gravity waves, um, you know the name that is, um, the electrostatic um, generation facility that generates these, these huge electrostatic charges close to like the center of the sun uh, in energy for um, doing fusion testing and stuff. And uh, the number one thing that they thought was coolest was this thing called the Earth Scope. <laughs> Okay, so it's it's the most epic science project that probably people who live near you have not heard about. <laughs> okay, so of course all the stuff we've told you, you probably know it's it's pretty epic too. Um, but the cool one of the things that, that rated it really high was the scale of area that is affected by this project. Um, it really is a um, continental wide and you know U.S. wide with Alaska um, science project that is within. 35, 40 kilometers of every single person living in the U.S. So it's in your backyard. So if they, you go to a school, you can look at data from the seismometer that's just a couple miles away from the school. If you go to a museum, you can look at the seismic data from the instrument that's possibly on the grounds of the museum, uh, depending on where we cited it. Um, so it really is kind of a project where people can feel like they're maybe not so part of it, but you have sort of that um, space place-based stuff, it's, it's in your place <laughs> with it. So you got a good opportunity while it's in Alaska to really generate interest with your visitors um, for a science project that's, that's ongoing. All right, so what, what kind of stuff do we have that lets you do things? Um, we do all kinds of things. Um, we do school products for formal education. We do museum displays. Um, we help folks with content for museum displays. We do professional development, like these kind of workshops for both school teachers and museum professionals and national park staff. Um, we create lesson plans and posters and animations that folks can use in their museum exhibits or in their school lessons. Um, and uh, all of our stuff is available on our website, um, iris.edu, and it's all available free of charge because we're National Science Foundation funded, so you've already paid for these things, so go use them. <laughs> so what kind of stuff? Um, one of our sort of school products is called the Recent Earthquake Teachable Moments. And we produce a PowerPoint and animation set uh, within 24 hours for every newsworthy magnitude 7 or larger earthquake that happens. So we compile all the stuff from USGS and IRIS and other places um, and put a PowerPoint together that sort of tells the story of the earthquake that um, school teachers can use with their students um, the next day. So kids hear about a big earthquake in Japan, they can go in and uh, the teacher can look like they're they're very knowledgeable about earthquakes because they pop up this presentation that they didn't spend much time working on because um, we compiled it for them. And uh, they have a chance to, to use the, the earthquake the kids have heard about in the news as sort of the lesson uh, for, for doing earthquakes. Um, so if you're a museum professional, you might not have that group of school kids coming in to that you're, you know, have a captive audience for because you have visitors coming by. But I will bet you that probably the news media calls you when there's a large earth science event or an astronomy event and they want the local expert who can tell them about the lunar eclipse or the earthquake or the rocket launch with it. So the way I would suggest that you guys use this is when there's a large earthquake, go to our website, download the recent earthquake teachable moment, 
read it really fast, and then when the news media calls, you can say, yes, we do have a local expert here who can talk about this earthquake because you read about it. Um, and then given some of our other products, uh, like our museum displays, you can then um, actually have the local, local bent on something that's, that's far away. And if uh, when the TA gets here and there's a seismic station nearby your museum, you really do have a local angle on it because now there's a science project that's currently happening that is collecting data from earthquakes all around the world right in your backyard. So you really are sort of the local resources for that. Um, so those, those are available um, on our website. Um, and we do animations. Um, we typically try to do really simple concept animations. So if there is an earth science concept, we'll do a 30 second to three minute animation on just that concept. So if it's subduction zones, it's only subduction zones. It's not subduction zones and volcanoes and, and volatiles coming off the plate and, and making magma. And it's, it's subduction zones with it. Um, if we talk about volcanoes, there's an animation about volcanoes. Um, the reason being, um, if you've seen some animations places, they have like 7,000 concepts in them. And you want to just talk about one thing, and it's kind of hard to use, use stuff. So we try to keep them really simple. Um, we produce things that are timely also, if there's a big um, seismological related event. So like the Great Alaska 1964 earthquake. We have an animation that talks about all about the earthquake. Ah. Um, and then we have concept ones. Um, this one here, um, whoop, stop, don't roll over that. Um, yeah, oh, stop. Okay, it's probably going to do both, so we'll just let it run. Um, okay, so, so you saw in my talk on Monday um, the earthquake where we had all the seismic stations and the waves rippled outwards. Um, this is that same data visualized slightly differently um, for you to use in a science classroom. So if you've been studying sound waves or water waves in your physics class or your physics program at the museum, um, you could ask kids, well, how are water waves like seismic waves? Well, they're both waves, and they both go out in three dimensions. So this is sort of a, a get kids thinking about similar concepts. So there's, there's the actual waves going out from the, the Wells, Nevada earthquake that we saw the other day. And it's a similar process happening there. OK. And then uh, we also produce the uh, ground motion visualizations that you saw. Um, we produce those for pretty much every single earthquake that the uh, TA detects. Um, so here is April 24th. There was an earthquake in Vancouver Island. Um, so when the news media calls up, download the Teachable Moment to learn about all the facts behind the earthquake. Download the visual, because they'll say, you got any cool visuals that we can put on the TV? And you can say, yes, we do. Here, this. And they'll go, whoa. And even folks who, um, who do a sort of science all, all the time, if you know Phil Plate, the bad astronomer who debunks bad science. Um, he saw this and he was blown away by it. He didn't know it existed. Um, he said, wow, that's a cool visualization of science. So, so uh, they're always looking for visuals for the news media out there. Um, and then we do, we do um, programs for museums. Um, we have a, a lecture series in conjunction with um, Seismological Society of America. We have two speakers every year that are um, researchers doing current research who are really good at talking to general public audiences. So we're really careful in picking our speakers to find ones that are really good at talking to you know, the fifth grader who has a question or the, the museum group that comes in to your, to your thing, and are doing research currently. So they can talk about you know, what they're doing. So you have a chance to have um, you know, um, some minority speakers come in or some female speakers and say, you know, here's a female doing science research, so you should do it too, uh, kind of thing. Um, for the lectureship, um, if you are doing a lecture series at your museum or educational facility or you have some special event that you do every year like National Astronomy Day or Earth Science Week, um, if you want to request a speaker, um, Iris pays all the travel costs for the speaker. So, ooh, yeah, you, you pretty much get a free speaker to come out and, and chat at your event. So check that out too. <laughs> and I'm sure they won't mind coming to Alaska <laughs> and uh, giving a talk. Um, and then we also do um, exhibits and displays um, for museums and uh, university lobbies and also school public spaces. Um, one of our displays is a non-interactive display called Earthquake Channel. Um, it's similar to the seismic monitor that um, you saw a little bit earlier in the GeoPrisms presentation. If you look behind you, it is running on the ginormous TV 
in the back. So imagine having that in your entryway to your museum as folks come in. Um, it updates every 15 minutes or so with live data. Uh, the red circles, at least on this version of the display, uh, represent earthquakes that happened in the past hour. Um, orange is the last day, and what is it? Uh, blue, yellow is the last month, I think. And the pink ones are last five years of seismicity, so you can sort of see the plate boundaries in there. And we're still fiddling a bit with this um, to add some details like a night-day terminator and the ability for you to pick and choose the maps that you want to display on there. But if you have this set up in your museum, um, when the press comes up, they often want to have a nice cool backdrop behind you. So you can put this up, stop it on the map that shows the region where the huge earthquake happened. Now you've got a backdrop, you've got a visual for them to use on TV, and you've got a 14-page PowerPoint that you read really quickly. So you're like, you're like the, the go-to place when earthquakes happen then. So boom, they're going to call you every time there's a big earthquake. Right, for the seismic monitor, that's on the website. Yeah. So if you want to view that on your computer or, or something, you can get it there. Uh, for the earthquake channel, um, it's actually a small piece of software you download um, to a computer that you have out in your exhibits. So you need a computer and some size flat screen TV. Um, bigger is better because it's more impressive, but it doesn't care as long as it's an HD TV um, and an internet connection. So we provide the software and the content for free. You provide the hardware to run it on. So if you have an old PC lying around you're not doing anything with and a small flat screen somewhere, you have an exhibit. You didn't know you had it. <laughs> Dust it off and pull it out and, and you can have an exhibit. Um, so yeah. Okay. Yeah, we do. Yeah, that, that's that's sort of on our back burner of things to do. Um, science on a sphere is a little different beast because it, it does sort of globe things, but it also does movies where you have non-globe things on it too. So there, there's a little bit for making content for that. But but uh, certainly certainly our view of the live data feed is different than the one that they have with the dots on it. So you have a chance to show some some little bit different visual with it. Um, and here it is in the um, Smithsonian Natural History Museum, and here it is at the New Madrid Historical Museum in there. Um, we also have an interactive public display called um, the Active Earth Monitor, um, which also runs on a computer with a touch screen, or if you don't have a touch screen, it runs with a trackpad or a mouse or a trackball. Um, and this is um, content that um, the content sets highlight um, regional geology, so we have a Cascadia set, we have a, a New Madrid set, we have a Basin and Range set, we have an Earthscope content set. We're working with uh, folks at University of Alaska Fairbanks on an Alaska content set, which should be available soon. Um, and these are, are sort of simple interfaces where, where a museum visitor could come up and click on it and learn about um, the geology of Alaska or learn about the earthquake in 1964 and what was important about it or learn about the plate boundaries. Um, there are pages in here where you can look at the local US Array seismic station or any other station that's online near your museum. Um, and you can also access the, um, the uh, GPS map that Shelley showed on the exhibit and also the US Array map on the exhibit. So you can click on stations and uh, see the 24-hour data from those stations or the year data for GPS. Um, for the entire US Array and the entire plate boundary observatory. So if a visitor comes to your museum from Kansas and they're not from Alaska, uh, and they look at the exhibit, they might want to learn about Alaska for a minute, then they're going to go over here to Kansas and click on it and see what's happening in their house uh, near their place. So that's kind of cool too. And you can create custom content for that too. Uh, the content lives as sort of um, HTML web pages. So if you can create a web page, you can create content to go on that with it too. And there's a variety of ways you can do it. Um, we do it with kiosks from a kiosk manufacturer. Uh, we've had folks do it with flat screen TVs and a trackball. Uh, we've had folks just use it in their school on computers when they're doing seismology for the week. Kids will explore the content set and then they turn it off and uh, use it again next year with it too. Um, kiosks can come to you too because we have a kiosk loan program where we will loan out um, a exhibit ready museum kiosk that's running Active Earth for one year. Um, we have been doing these in the area where USRA currently exists. So they have been from about uh, the middle of the country over to the east uh, the yellow ones are folks that applied this year for it. Um, in 2015, we will be uh, accepting applications from folks in Alaska. So if you want a kiosk to show up for free for a year um, to live at your place, you can apply for that. Anyone from the State Fair talk to you guys about bringing this to the State Fair? 
No? We had, we, yeah, in Missouri. In Missouri, they did. We already missed the window that says we wanted something in 2014, which would be the anniversary of the earthquake in the state fair. If we missed our window of opportunity. Well, there was no window of opportunity for Alaska this year. Because Alaska is next year. But that. There's nothing we could get to come up to this year. Possibly. Yeah, talk to us later about things. But next next year, we'll, we'll have applications for Alaska. Because we want we want to have it follow where the TA is actually located. Yeah, there's, there's a there's a timely reason to do that. So, <clears throat> yeah, talk to me later okay. about it. We can we can always work things out <laughs> with stuff. Um, so what else? Uh, oh, another another little exhibit you can add along with that too is a make your own earthquake exhibit, uh, where we have a, a small geophone sensor hooked up to a computer, and and families and kids can jump up and down and make their own earthquake on the on the software, and kids will jump up and down, you know, trying to beat their siblings. <laughs> in making large earthquakes <laughs> at your place. Uh, this is at the uh, Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, they had a huge exhibit called uh, Changing Earth. It was about 3,000 square feet, I think, with it. And it covered hurricanes and volcanoes and earthquakes and uh, plate tectonics and everything else that, that changes on the Earth. Um, and in the, in the earthquake section, uh, we did a little make your own earthquake. Uh, they built the little uh, enclosure here to hold the sensor with it. But uh, the actual exhibit itself is this uh, geophone sensor that we can get for you for no cost. And there's a little um, digital to analog converter you have to purchase for like $100 to go to the computer. So you can have a make your own earthquake exhibit for a fairly low cost also. And then over here in the back, uh, they're running uh, a modified version of some of our interactive active earth content uh, on here with the, with the world map. Uh, and they put some um, hazard data on there too, like uh, cities that had nuclear power plants that people could click on to see how that overlaid with the earthquake data and also um, cities that had uh, subway systems, because that was part of their story. <laughs> um, earthquakes happening where you're in a subway, I guess. Um, and what they found was when the uh, Japan earthquake happened, um, this is a, an incredibly small part of this huge museum in there. The biggest crowds were gathered around this little tiny screen uh, watching aftershocks come in for the Japan earthquake for like days at the museum. You, you couldn't get over to that exhibit <laughs> because people were crowded around it looking at the live data coming in. So, so live data is cool to have in your place. It's, it's happening now with things. Um, another data product you can use is called the Iris Earthquake Browser. Um, it's a Google Maps type interface that allows you to um, sort of look at the entire database of earthquakes from 1960 till now. Um, you can zoom around, pick and choose the time range, the magnitude range, uh, what else is on there? Uh, the depth on it, uh, color is depth. You can zoom in on, on certain regions. And we have lessons online that you can use if you're a school teacher with your kids that are standards-based. Um, but you can also use them if you're doing summer camps with kids or holiday camps with folks visiting your museum, um, where, where they'll go through and they'll pick a region and they'll have to try to figure out what the plate boundaries are happening in that region. They pick a different region which has a different plate boundary kind of thing. And then uh, the one that we have currently online looks at uh, the Africa Rift and they try to figure out what's going on in that sort of complex region. And I'm rewriting it uh, to have an Alaska theme as the end, what's, what's going on in Alaska with the, the strange sort of, you know, subductions and transforms that are happening in the south there. Um, so that's kind of cool. And then you can view it in 3D. So uh, folks can see, can actually see the subducting plate going down in there. It's kind of hard to see with it just as a picture. Um, and then we have another product called Rapid Earthquake Viewer, where you can actually get seismograms from earthquakes. Um, we have a lesson where you can use those seismograms to locate an earthquake on an inflatable globe. So you can do some little triangulation and figure out where the earthquake happened. Um, but you can get the seismic data for that activity for any earthquake that exists. So if there's a huge earthquake the week you're doing summer camp, you can download all the seismograms from that particular earthquake and then have the kids figure out where did it happen. So a lot of ways to use, use data. Um, you can find us all kinds of places on the, the social interwebby stuff down there. Um, on our Facebook page, we, we do a lot of um, sort of general um, seismology, volcanology, earth science-y kind of news. You know, here's something cool we saw. Uh, we do trivia questions every week, the uh, Tembler Tuesday mystery, so you can, you know, brush up on your uh, <laughs> earthquake knowledge. Uh, and then we do sort of a, a where in the world Wednesday thing every now and again where we post a cool place on the earth that ha has some kind of cool ge geology there and try to figure out where it is on there. Um, the Seismographs in Schools one, if you, if you go on that one, um, there's a, a Twitter account too for that one, uh, Quakes, Quakes and Templar, will actually give you an update when there's a new recent earthquake teachable moment. So you'll get a Twitter notification only when there's a new one. 
So if one pops up, you can say, oh, there was a big earthquake somewhere. I can go check that out real quick before the news media calls me and wants me to talk on there. And then on YouTube, we have all of our animations and videos, webinars. You can search for them there also, and they'll uh, link you back to our website.